Sheila Hardy, and I'm the founder and CEO of Because It's Personal. And here with me is my co-host, Erica, we are the world, Scott, <laughs> Black Changes, Inc. And this is Community Nonprofit Network Podcast, a.k.a. CNN. Our motto is, where your nonprofit shines. Hey, Erica, what's happening? Hey, Sheila, how are you? I'm doing fine, doing great. Uh, I got a great, great interview today, and he actually was here uh, once before, and want to just let you know our topic is grant writing tips. So let's do it again with David Pales. <laughs> That's what we're going to be doing, grant writing tips. David, how you doing? I am doing well, Sheila. Thank you for asking. All right. Good, good. We know that you had a little bit of set back with COVID, but look, you took care of it. It's okay yeah, now. It's All okay. Right. Okay, so, good, good. So you, you're you raring to go. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about um, grant writing, and let's talk about tips. Well, first of all, what is grant writing, or, or what is a grant? Let's put it that way. That's okay. A better, better question. I, I think that's a great place to start. Okay. Um, and to use very basic and simple uh, language, a grant is free money. Uh, it's different from a loan because you, it's 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 money that someone gives you that you don't have to pay back in order to do a certain project or certain task. Um, so that's that's a that's the uh, ostensibly the, the major difference between a grant and a loan and basically what a grant is. Awesome. Okay. And so for me to get a grant, um, I have to know what about why I want a grant. I have to know what, what. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, grants take, the, uh, take on different forms. There are grants that are provided for uh, businesses, for-profit uh, organizations, and uh, those types of grants can range from uh, helping you with uh, startup costs. Uh, they could also include uh, land acquisition, operating costs. Uh, they could help you to, if you're interested in uh, helping to market your business, expand your business. Um, so, you know, in the in the for-profit arena, uh, principally those are the, uh, the major types of, of grants uh, that you find. Um, and it's really interesting. You know, I've been at this um, for over uh, 20 years now, and um, it's been quite cyclical. Uh, when I first started out uh, as a company uh, writing grants, uh, we wrote grants for businesses. And there were, um, there was a lot of monies out there uh, for businesses, um, grants for businesses. Uh, over time, I, I, I would say from 2000 to Around 2008, 2010, uh, those funds started to kind of dry up a little bit. Um, and, and so most of the grants that you would find were primarily, uh, grants that were provided by the federal government. Uh, however, uh, those grants were more specific for uh, research and development. Okay. How, however, as we move forward to um, present time, and particularly um, post-COVID, we are finding more and more grants uh, that are available 
uh, for businesses doing a whole wide range of different activities. Uh, there are now grants, uh, quite a few actually grants, uh, for the uh, food and beverage industry, primarily because the food and beverage restaurants, if you will, have been hit hard as a result of, of um, the pandemic. And so we're, we're finding uh, through a number of different um, uh, mechanisms, if you will, uh, the increase in, in funding opportunities that are now available for um, uh, different kinds of business. Uh, one of the things it's really interesting um, that has happened post COVID is that uh, it has forced people to rethink how they go about doing business. One of the uh, more current trends uh, that we're seeing is that um, many people are now wanting to do their own thing. They want to be their own boss. Yeah, I guess a lot of folks got used to being at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you've, you've got all these, these, uh, home based businesses, cottage businesses that have sprung up seemingly overnight and the, the opportunities to do uh, e-commerce, uh, to work from home, to work behind a computer and, and earn an income. Uh, in order to feed yourself and support your family has increased exponentially. So as a result of that, there are, uh, more opportunities out there for, um, individuals to, uh, start a business, expand a business, um, move from having a hobby and transitioning to a more uh, formalized, uh, business opportunity. So, um, you know, that it, it's really been great. It's been great for me, I must say. Um, uh, and, um, so that's, that's what has been happening on the for-profit side. It's somewhat in a nutshell. Now, uh, let's step back for a second and let's take a look at the nonprofit community. The nonprofit ecosystem always, uh, has been an interesting part of the, uh, of the grant community, um, has always been there. Funding has always been there. However, understandably in the nonprofit community, most of our our, our funding opportunities have come from either uh, governmental agencies, we're talking federal, state, local. We have grants that are provided by foundations. We have grants that are provided by corporations. And we have grants that are provided via individuals. Okay, with that being said, oftentimes these funding sources, and I'm talking now more so with respect to um, foundations, corporations, and individuals, most of these grants are, as they are provided through those types of, of, of organizations, are, are based to a great degree on what's going on in the economy. One of the things that, that we do when we say, for example, when if, if we wanted to, to identify a grant for because it's personal and we have an understanding of, uh, what your primary thrust is, say it's transitional housing. Okay. So we're able to utilize a number of different search engines. We identify, uh, those organizations, either federal, state, local, uh, foundations, corporations, and individuals that will fund 
uh, transitional housing within your geographic area. After, after having made that identification, then we will drill down. Okay. One of the tools that we use, we will look at the, the, the companies, uh, it's called a 990. It's, it's a form. It's a, it's a tax form. It's, it's the nonprofit 10, 1040. Okay. So the 990 is a form that nonprofit foundations, corporate, they file for to the IRS, but it also gives you an understanding of where the monies are coming from. Okay. If someone has a, say, a, a million dollar foundation, well, it may, they may have a million dollars, uh, that they have in terms of, 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 uh, assets. But as, as you look at their financials, you'll see that these, uh, these foundations or corporations, they invest that money. Okay. So as they invest that money, the monies that they, they have to divvy out to the nonprofit community is based on how well that stock or how well that, that investment vehicle that they have used with that million dollars. Okay. So kind of circle back. Uh, if the economy is doing well and they've made a good return on their investment, then they have more monies to divvy out to the nonprofit community. If the economy isn't doing that well, then there's less money to divvy out to the nonprofit community. That's one piece. The second piece of this is that the number of nonprofit organizations have steadily increased over the years. Okay? So, you've got a situation whereby you have, you may or may not have a large pool of monies, but you've got a a larger pool of individuals going after that same piece of money. So the, 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 the landscape has become a very, uh, uh, competitive situation. So it, it, it makes for, it, it, it makes for very interesting dynamics. Uh, one of the things that, uh, we're seeing more and more within the nonprofit, uh, grant ecosystem is that many of the Funders are now looking to see, okay, is there collaboration with other nonprofit organizations or with other entities that could assist you in doing what it is that you're doing? Um, it, it, and it makes sense from, a, uh, from an economic standpoint, but what it also does it, it is that it it eliminates the need for replication. If uh, you're doing something, Sheila, uh, and Erica is five blocks away, and she's, <laughs> doing, and she's doing the same thing, then it would make sense to sort of um, provide an, a, a, an incentive right. for the two of you to come together, work together in order to address a certain socioeconomic issue. Right. Uh, so it, it's, it's very efficient. It's very effective. Um, and, and I, I, I believe I'm seeing more and more where particularly as again in the nonprofit ecosystem that people have caught on. And they are more comfortable with working together. Um, so it, it's, 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 it's less and less a situation 
uh, whereby someone uh, will stand up on a soapbox and beat their chest and say, we're doing this, we're the, you know, you know, this is something that we're doing. We're the only right, ones who are doing right. it. Um, that's, that's, that's not where it is nowadays. Now it's about, uh, partnerships. And, and I, I, I will say, I know from, uh, experience, Sheila, that that's, that's definitely, uh, one of your strengths, uh, in terms of being able to reach out to people and, and developing those relationships and, and, and developing partnerships. Uh, with other organizations. So I just like to take this opportunity to applaud you, uh, for those efforts. Uh, you, you've been doing a, a most excellent job with that. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I, I feel so. Can, can, can I interject, please? Yes. <laughs> please. I was going to say it in the beginning, but Sheila, uh, kept the mic. I want to say, Ms. Sheila Hardy, CEO and founder of Because It's Personal, Inc., uh, congratulations on receiving your 501c3 certification. You've been telling the audience, <laughs> you've, been, you've been sharing with our listeners uh, since the first episode that you don't have it yet. You don't have it yet. And this is what, episode number 19, I believe? Yay! So I want to say congratulations for still like David just said, he's still going through with partnerships and having a conversation um, as if you already had it, knowing that it was coming, not getting flustered, frustrated, or uh, distracted um, behind it. And um, and I, I hope that serves as inspiration for other nonprofit founders who are, you know, in the same process. And it may take, I mean, honestly, what, it took eight months when it typically should only take about well, okay, 14 weeks, but we are talking about Uncle Sam, IRS, <laughs> you know. So I just want to say uh, thank you for, yes, uh, still going through with the conversations and the Skype calls and the, the meetings and all that good stuff um, in spite of not having it, knowing that it was just going to have to catch up with you when it finally did come. i just like to make one one observation um, with that so that folks will, will – have a, a, a maybe a clear understanding. Um, when when you apply for nonprofit status uh, with the federal government, it's a a five hundred one c three tax exempt status with the federal government. There are basically two types of of applications that you file. You could either file a 1023 application. That's a full application. And that's contingent upon, uh, whether or not your organization is expecting to receive, uh, more than $50,000 within a, uh, within a, a, a calendar year. Is that, okay. is that the one that we, that because it's personal, you, you applied that for mine? Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Because of the kinds of things that you're planning on doing, right. uh, your budget actually um, will exceed uh, fifty thousand. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty big. That 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 wouldn't um, that wouldn't do much for you based on what your plans are. Correct. Okay. And I now, just want to remind our listeners that that David is working with me. He's working for me to. Help me do this. So I just want to let you know. Okay, go ahead, David. Sorry. Okay. Now, uh, that application, and, and it's you. You could visit the the IRS website. They let you know up front that it will take a minimum of 180 days. Okay, before that application is even reviewed or sent to the person that will make a determination about your application, okay? The other uh, filing is the uh, 1023-EZ. Uh, it's, like, it's like the 1040 where you have all the different schedules, Schedule C's right. and Schedule A's, and, okay? 
with the 10, with the, uh, 1023 EZ, it's a, a very simple form. Um, there, it, it doesn't ask for the, the amount and detailed information that the, uh, the regular, uh, if you will, uh, 1023 asks for. Uh, and those usually take, those types of applications, uh, don't take quite as long as the, they call it the streamlined, uh, application. So there is a difference and it depends on, uh, where you see your, your organization currently and where you see, where would you see your organization in terms of, um, uh, uh, operating funding uh, over a period of time, usually with over a three-year period. Gotcha. Good mm-hmm. information. Good information. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, there are so many different um, different aspects. Uh, again, within the uh, uh, grant writing ecosystem. Uh, and I would say the most important thing, if it's a for-profit, if it's a non-profit organization, is to have a clear vision. Okay? To have a yeah. really clear vision in your mind and written down somewhere um, uh, about what what it is. I mean, who are you? What is it that you're trying to do? Um, what issue are you attempting to address, particularly on the in the nonprofit community? Uh, that's that's key because if you don't have a clear vision, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for you to articulate that to someone that you're asking money for. It's very, it would be, but even more so, it's very difficult if you don't have a clear vision of who you are and what you are and why you're there, why are you existing in the first place? I mean, that I would say is paramount, having a clear vision. Um, the second tip I would say, I would suggest is to begin to write down uh, what you understand, what you believe to be your your mission, your vision, and your values. Okay? That kind of exercise will help you to focus on how you could better serve the community at large. Um, it will also help you to better understand what demographic or what socioeconomic issue are you trying to address? Right. Are there, uh, is, is, is this a, uh, an issue with, um, uh, Finding housing for formerly incarcerated individuals. And if so, um, how do you plan to help them? Okay. Um, let me, let me, let me also back up for a minute and say, uh, and give you one of, um, David's, um, uh, truisms. <laughs> one of the things that I've learned over the 22 plus years that I've been doing this as a business is that I have found that needs do not get funded. Programs do. Okay. And let me, let me repeat that again. Needs don't get funded, but programs do. Oftentimes, and I'm talking specifically in the nonprofit uh, ecosystem is that Someone will see a need to do something. Uh, they see a homeless per- 
people on the street. And, oh, that's terrible. I want to do something about it. Let's get some money to to help them. And that's fine. That That's where it all starts. But if you don't have a well-thought-out program, then you're not going to be seriously considered in terms of funding um, from anyone, actually. So, uh, once again, there could definitely be a need to do something, to address an issue, but if you don't have a program in place uh, that spells out exactly what it is, who it is that you're trying to help, how are you going to help them, where you're going to help them, when you're going to help them, as well as uh, having uh, certain metrics in place. When I say metrics, I mean some tool that you're going to be able to to, to use that will show how effective your program is. No one's going to give you money just to give you money. How are you going to evaluate how well you're doing your job? How are you going to to justify uh, anyone providing you funding to do something if if there is, first of all, there's no program, but even more so, if you don't have a a um, an evaluation tool, if you will, that will let someone know or or, or gain a clear understanding, the efficacy of your efforts. So that, that's one of my, that's one of my main little things, I guess you could say, um, but particularly in the uh, nonprofit ecosystem. Well, can I, can I interject please and ask you this? Sure. How, how does a new nonprofit who has the, the need, sees the need that they're going to you know, help out with, and they have a program. Um, they know the KPIs they will be shooting for, but have no history to relay to the potential grant maker. So you're, 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 if I'm understanding your question, Erica, you're asking if you're new, um, to the, uh, to the scene, you're, <laughs> right. you're a new organization, you don't have a, a history of success. How exactly. does someone, well, you know, let me, let me just say this. Um, and, I, and I hope this doesn't sound biblical, but there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's true. <laughs> Chances are what you're planning on doing, someone else has already done. Right. If, if not exactly, then fairly close to it. Okay. So. <clears throat> To address your question, um, if you're planning to do, let, let's just say transitional housing for uh, ex-offenders or formerly incarcerated individuals, someone else somewhere on this planet has done that in the past. Right. Okay. So then it would be incumbent upon you to, to uh, do your research, understand, what those other programs have done, what worked for them, and modified, if you will, I'm going to say modified for lack of a better word, to to how those other uh, uh, programs and how that might fit with your unique situation, and and then be able to utilize uh, those various kinds of uh, evaluation tools to to help you uh, uh, craft a program that's going to be effective. Okay. Does that so, answer? Yeah, that that answered the question, and and thank you. So, uh, how about? Um, Sheila and I have food rescue operations, right? That we're looking, we're both brand new, uh, start like, like we did, just start back to back. So, um, 
just because this has been done before, that means a grant maker is what is, what is a grant maker looking for to determine they only they're only giving one away. So what are they looking for to determine if it's going to Sheila with because it's personal or Erica with life changers? Are you saying that you have two organizations and you're both doing the same thing? And which organization would that, would get the money? Would Sheila get the money? Which is exactly. If, if because neither one of us have history. What what does a new what does a newbie nonprofit need to make sure uh, or need to at least try to have um, experience knowledge? I mean, how do they demonstrate I can do this? Well, there there are, there are a lot of different moving parts, Erica, and and there's I'm I'm not sure if there's one simple uh, response to your question, and and, I, and I'll I'll explain why I say this. Okay, part of the problem, or probably part of the problem that that you're you will be met with is it, particularly if you if you're new. Uh, they will want to look at certain things about your organization. For example, do you have a board? Okay. Tell me about your board. And I'm just having, and, and does your board have an understanding? Does your board have an understanding of what your mission is? Do you have an active board? Do you have a board that understands um, what it means to be a part of a board? So that that's one thing. And, and we could actually talk for hours just about uh, your 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 board of directors in and of itself. OK, uh, so that's 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 one one piece. The second piece, Erica, is that uh, here's something that we do here at DB Pines and Associates. When we're looking for funding for our clients, as I mentioned earlier, one of, what we do, if, if say Sheila came to me and say, okay, David, we want to do this transitional housing for uh, formerly incarcerated individuals. And we go through our various search engines and We've identified, um, say, 10 potential funders. What happens at that point is that we will begin to make contact with those funders. Okay. We'll call them up. We write letters. Um, and basically what we're doing is that we're establishing a relationship. And here's why. Okay. And I'm, I'm just using this as an example. I know Sheila a little bit better. She and I, we've interacted more so than you and I have, right? Right. Okay. So, Sheila, if I came to you um, tomorrow and I said, Sheila, I could really, uh, could you let me have a $100? Okay. Uh, chances are, because Sheila and I, we, she knows me, we've talked, we have a relationship, the chances are that Sheila would be more willing to give me that $100 than if I came to you, Erica. Um, you know, we've talked, but, you know, we, we have a, we don't have the same uh, uh, relationship that I have with, with Sheila. So you may give it to me, but you, you know, you're like, mm, I don't really know yeah, you. Let me that think about well, it. Baby. I really, <laughs> I really don't know you that well, you know, so I might have to pass on this one. Um, you know, holler at me a little bit, you know, <laughs> holler at me a little bit later and, uh, you know, I'll see what I could do for you. Right. So right. It, it's that kind of a thing. And that's what I'm saying. It, it's it's not um, there's no one uh, clear cut uh, uh, answer or solution, uh, particularly 
if you're if you're if you're a newbie and you don't have a history of of having received grants in the past um, because you have no history. Right. And then what's also important is that uh, within your within your program and that, that once again, I'll go back. I get back to the the program aspect of your of your organization that you have other things in place. For example, um, that you have a an accounting system in place and an accounting system that is consistent with uh, what's known as GAAP, uh, generally accepted accounting principles, because I want to make sure that when that money comes to you, that that money is used specifically for the purposes in which it was intended. Right. Okay. And not to, to fund, um, uh, your daughter's volleyball facility somewhere, uh, but will be used to help the people in which it was intended. Right. Okay. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, having an accounting system. So the, the, the program you said, you know, having, uh, making sure, uh, that when you, when you establish your program or when you craft the program, uh, that your budget is straight. Okay. That everybody understands, uh, uh, how the monies will be spent, uh, that, uh, there's another piece within, uh, all funding, uh, it's called administrative overhead. In the past, people took real advantage of that. Uh, and, and so say, for example, uh, to, if, for those who don't understand what that means, administrative overhead is the cost that the, uh, the grantee charges to administer a grant. Okay. So, if your administrative overhead is more than 30% or so, um, then mm, that, 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 that may make some potential, uh, donors pause. I'm sure. Wow. Okay. And that's happened in the past. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, that it, it was, it was not uncommon for, uh, grantees to indicate that um their administrative overhead cost was um forty percent of the grant. So okay. you know there like uh, you know there 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 are a number of different things uh that that needs to be in place uh that the uh potential grantee uh needs to be uh aware of uh and and so What's also helpful is if the organization that you are partnering with has had a history of having received grants. Right. Okay. So um, those are some of the the, the main points, um, and there are others uh, that that kind of go into the sauce, if you will. Uh, but those are some of the, the the issues that have cropped up, uh, at least based on my experiences over the years, uh, that have um, either helped or, or hindered uh, an organization from receiving a grant. Okay. Okay. Well, since, since you touched on it, can you tell us real quick um, if it's a quick number? What, uh, if you're going by percentages, what percentage should administrative costs be? Uh, is, we know it shouldn't be 30%. So what, maybe 8, 10, 15? Usually around 15%. 15. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Usually around 15. Okay. Well, Sheila and I were talking earlier before you came on, David, asking, uh, or wondering, uh, so of course we're going to ask you because you're the expert in the room. Um, as far as grants, we, we, you know, this is the Community Nonprofit Network podcast. So, of course, we speak 
mostly, you know, usually just to nonprofits, but for nonprofits throughout the year, or is there a season? She'll use the word season. So is there a season or seasons um, that we should be aware that there, that grants are more readily available than others? I know with like government, a lot of times that is in the beginning of the year because they've just started their budget, you know, started dipping into their budget. But what about grants in general? It's it's a year round process. It, it really is. Uh, I know that some grant writers who would say, well, you know, the summer months are usually um, their busiest time of the year. Uh, but you know, once again, and I'm only speaking from my own personal experience, I would say that it's basically year round. Um, right now, we're in the final quarter. Uh, of the calendar year and, uh, I've got some, some, uh, grant applications that we're currently working on, um, uh, with, um, a September 27th, uh, deadline. I've got some that are coming up that are, uh, March 4th, March 5th, March, 6th, I mean, I'm sorry, October 4th, 5th, and 7th deadlines. I've got some that uh, where their deadlines are in November. Uh, now, okay, let me let me let me let me back up again. <laughs> and say this too. Uh, it also depends. Okay, if you're looking at a grant based on giving uh, for a um, for a foundation, most foundations uh, may meet on a quarterly basis. Okay, oh. so uh, what you want to do is you want to get your applications in uh, at the beginning uh, of that quarter, and then when their board meets, uh, your application will be there. You would the conversations would have taken place between the grant writer and the organization uh, so that when they meet, they, the board, meets and they come to your application, uh, the person that you've spoken with can say, oh, yeah, um, I remember having a conversation with Erica and this is what they're doing. And so, um, I think, I think this is something that, um, we may want to in fact find. Okay. So, so that's part of it. The other part too is that, um, there are other grants. For example, um, uh, Walmart has a grant. And their funding is not based on a deadline, but it's based on funding availability. Okay. So for the, say, for example, with the Walmart grant, um, uh, if the program that you're planning to, uh, to, to initiate is located within a certain geographic area, of a Walmart store, then you could, you basically, you would apply, uh, uh, through their grant, right, grant portal to a particular store. And, um, there is no, uh, there is no deadline. There is no time frame right. for having to have a, an application in. It's based on whether or not they have funding that are earmarked for for nonprofit organizations. Right. Now, if you're looking to solicit funding uh, from an individual, then my God, um, you know it. It all kinds of variables come into play because you're dealing with an individual, and based on However, they decide, uh, to craft, uh, their, 
uh, fund disbursement um, um, process, uh, it, it runs the gamut. Um, some grants you could, you, some applications you could send to an individual and get a response back in, you know, five to seven to ten business days. Others will may take much longer than that. Well, that, that that's good to know. Thank you. That's definitely mm-hmm. something to uh to think about. Yeah. So if you want to, um, I think we uh, talked about this before. I can't remember. You know, getting older. But um, with the nonprofit and wanting to include a for-profit, that can happen. Uh, explain. What do you mean by that? Um, like, if, like I have a nonprofit, but um, what if I want to incorporate a for-profit in my nonprofit? Is that possible or not? What well, now? When you say incorporate. Tell me exactly what if it I is. Want, if I want to add with my nonprofit a organization that is a for profit, can I do that? Does that make sense, or can I? I don't know if I'm saying it right. Erica, help me out. Yeah, so, it's like a lot of for profits will have an an outreach like a nonprofit arm. So she's saying opposite, like if because it's personal is transitional housing, and then they want to open up a real estate brokerage for-profit arm of the organization. That's right, yeah. Sheila? That sound yeah. about right? Can I, can I do it? Yeah. Can I do that? Generally speaking, when you get your uh, – when you complete your, your application, it's the 1023 mm-hmm. form that you file with the IRS. Uh, you have made certain declarations about what this organization is, okay? Um, that how you're going to re- be receiving your funds, what your organization's about, what your budget is, da 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 da. da. So, uh, in general, you're 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 sort of of uh locked in um, to that based on what you've already told the IRS that you're going to do. Now if you understood from the beginning that you were thinking about um incorporating, if you will, um, a for-profit piece to your nonprofit, then that was that was something that uh, maybe should have been done at the very beginning. Now, let me also say this: just because you are a nonprofit organization doesn't mean that you can't charge for services. Okay, you can. Um, and as a matter of fact, oftentimes that is encouraged. Right. Okay. So, so it 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 may not be, um, it may not be necessary to establish a separate uh, or a. It may not be necessary to establish a for-profit entity that would fall under the umbrella of your nonprofit organization. Okay. Say, for example, Sheila, uh, if you're doing a, a, a transitional housing situation for formerly incarcerated individuals uh, and you plan to do uh, counseling. Okay. Now there's based on how your nonprofit is structured, you would not be prohibited from charging um 
a a fee, okay, for your um, for your services, for your counseling services, okay, uh, and and that's that's something that's done all the time, okay. If you have um, uh, uh, materials uh, that you're going to be um, uh, uh, disseminating, distributing uh, to people, they're 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 partic- particularly educational uh, material, and you want to charge a fee for that, you would be well within your rights in order to do so. Okay, so I, I hope that I've answered at least your question in part. Yeah, the, because one thing about it is um, with and I'm not trying to put all my stuff out there, but, um, you know, when I know when um, there's three months, I believe, if I got this right, where the state when once the um, once the the people that we're going to be working with come out of jail um, and then they take care of them for I think it's three months and then after that they should have a job by then and blah 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 but the way our program is they will stay in this program for a year or so and then they will be paying for and that's where I'm thinking okay that's money coming in but it's also going into program. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. And yeah. So, <laughs> and so with that being said, and then of course we're thinking about, you know, also creating jobs, um, that we create jobs where if they can't find something uh, immediately, they will be working with what we have created. So sure. that's where the question <laughs> came about. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Can we do this? So yeah, that's great. That is that is awesome. Awesome. Well, um, one thing about it is is that we want to. It's getting close to to ending this, but um, David, this is good information that we need. Yes. And um, and we want to thank you because this is the second time you've been with us. So you, you're you're not new. <laughs> you're the first repeat. Yay! Well, yeah, it, 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 it's always a pleasure to be in company if if uh, if, if only virtual with two uh, amazing, intelligent uh, um, uh, young ladies, and and um, I I'm just so delighted uh, that you have invited me to uh, uh, share some information and. About oh, what it is that you. you all are doing, and um, uh, it, it, I'm having fun. Oh, that's thank what you. we want you to do. We want you to have fun. Yes. And one thing about it is, because we did this before, what would you do with you in the first one? So I really don't. <laughs> I don't have anything. Well, I do. Let me see. Uh, you ready for I'm one? Say, Miss Question. One que- Yeah. <laughs> well, well, because because we did this in the beginning. And I don't want to go over it again. Um, um, however, it just came to me. And what I want to do is, because one thing about with um, David, <laughs> I, I hopefully he won't get mad with me, but David is is um, seeking God's, um, um, I don't want to say approval, but seeking an answer concerning about what he wants to do next concerning about his ministry. And, awesome. Um, you know, it's really something because the principle of a lot of people don't understand that um, God has principles that don't change and that works. Right. And he's, you know, he's seeking that. I, I haven't talked to him in a while. But anyway, my question to you is, what would you do if you knew concerning this concerning your whole um, perspective of what you're doing now? Uh, what would you do? If you knew you could not fail in anything, in your in your seek to in your quest to, you know, do what God is calling you to do, um, the the business that you're you're working with me, if you knew you couldn't fail. <laughs> well, you know, 
part of this is it's a business for me. Um, it's it's how I I, I earn my living. Um, but it's also part of what I consider to be my ministry. You know, awesome. um, because it's it's really what I find um, most rewarding is being a part of someone's journey. Uh, And if your, if your goal is to, to help others, um, and, and, and and I see that and, and I understand that with, with both, uh, you, Sheila, as well as Erica, uh, then, you know, that, that is, that is so rewarding for me. Um, and, and I, and I mean that in all earnest. Um, um, because there, there are so, so many issues. There are so many people in this world who are hurting. Yes. And who honestly, honestly need help. Yes. You know, and we're finding more and more that, uh, there are people out there, unfortunately, who will take advantage. Yes, yes, yes. Of, of the downtrodden. Uh, and it's, 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 it's just so rare that you find people like yourselves, you know, who are really genuine. Right. And who really have the heart, uh, and the desire to help people. And, and, and so for me to be able to be a part, um, of that is, is just, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's awesome. So if I could not fail, uh, it would be to be able to help more people like yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> what would you do? If there was no more internet, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm, I'm not going to give our ages away, but I, I know we, I'm sure we can think about one day when we didn't have access to the internet way back when, what would you um, do, David? I don't want to think about it. I don't, you know, I, I often, <laughs> want, you know, look, um, uh, you know, cause my wife gets on me all the time. Because uh, my my phone is always in my hand or on my hip or or somewhere mm-hmm. nearby, and you know I'm um, sending out emails, reading emails, responding to texts, making calls, receiving calls. Um, it has just become uh, computers and the internet has just become such a a integral uh, yes. part of my life. Uh, wow. Um, ooh. Ooh we, we we. Well, let me interject because see, you've been doing this for a long time before all this internet and all this stuff. You did this a long time ago. Uh huh. Yeah. So, but, but not 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 at this level. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, I when we when I first started writing grants, it was back in the eighties. That's what I'm saying. Right? <laughs> and uh, you know it was all done paper. You mailed your you know you mailed your proposal in, and you 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 sat by the mailbox and you waited for a response or you got on. The, at least we did. I did have a telephone, um, <laughs> <laughs> so we <laughs> you, you you we were able to make a call to a building and. Right. Not a person, uh, so uh, that that made the whole the whole strategy has changed, and I mean uh, not just in terms of of uh, where we started in in ni- in, in nineteen eighty and, and 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 looking at where we are today, 
But as I as I I start as I said earlier, things have changed considerably post COVID. Yes. I'll give you a, I'll give you a brief example. We now have uh, clients across the United States, um, as well as in, in Africa and in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, prior to that time, we were pretty much local, regional at best. Okay. Uh, but because of what had happened, what had happened was, uh, <laughs> what, what COVID and it, it really it forced people to feel more comfortable. With doing what we're doing now. Right. With virtual meetings. So, um, uh, people, uh, actually many, uh, particularly within my demographic, uh, uh, my cohorts are now more comfortable with using computers and they feel more comfortable with either Skype or Zoom or any of the other kinds of virtual um, uh, meeting platform uh, that we now use in business. Uh, so it has, it has actually expanded um, uh, our reach and we're able to reach more people. And awesome. uh, as I said, we, 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 we've got clients in Africa. We've got basically um, we're, we're international now where we weren't before. Right. Well, you'd be back to uh, maybe maybe uh, reduced to a brother's word. Um, <laughs> uh, what was it called? The brothers? Oh my gosh, what was that called? Well, uh, what was the machine called? Come on, you know. I don't know. What you it know. wasn't a word. It, word processing. That's what it was. Word process before Word before Microsoft. Um, Okay, y'all acting like I'm the oldest one in the room. Come on now. I when I was a sales secretary for a five star hotel, um, I w- we didn't have Microsoft yet, so I was on a brother's word processor. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh, uh huh. <laughs> <Okay, laughs> I, so I remember. I, like, I remember the old. We used to call them trash eighties. Um, the Radio Shack, uh, uh, computers with the huge uh five and a quarter floppy disk yes 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 okay yes i i I go back that far i i remember (laughs) the uh uh the 386 computers and yes we moved to the 46 and now (laughs) we're we're, you know but doing something going from the 386 to the 486 (laughs) what I have arrived. Don't <laughs> play with me. I'm getting things done. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can remember going from the uh, 60 uh, megabyte hard drive to 100 megabyte, and, and I was in high cotton, you know. <laughs> now, I mean, now we're talking tetrabytes of data storage. Yes. Um, now everything's in the cloud. Yes. You know, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Things have definitely progressed. It is, I, and 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 I, I'll I'll say this: I think no matter what age you are, if you work online in, at any degree, you're not trying to even think about no internet. <laughs> like, go back to the internet. I'm retiring. <laughs> so the dog walking. I mean, you can't even have a dog walking service uh, without some kind of app. You know, wagger, waggle, whatever it's right. called. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just thought that when you you said something, and it, like, well, what would he do without the internet? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, you okay, know, I, I remember that. looking at um, I was, I think it may have been on YouTube, and I saw this uh, grandmother um, had her uh, her her grandkids, uh, and she had an old rotary phone. Oh yes, yes. And she asked him to call somebody <laughs> on the rotary phone, you know. <laughs> and these are Gen Zers or, or even younger, and they could not figure out how to use a rotary phone. Hilarious, you know. Hilarious. 
Yeah. I think I watched that about five times straight. Okay. It was okay. a good laugh. A yeah. good laugh. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember, I, I'll say this one real quick, and then I know we got to go. When my grandson was about uh, one and a half, two years old, and my mm-hmm. grandmother was still a flip phone uh, till she passed. She tried to go to smartphone, took <laughs> took it back to Walmart, got her flip phone back. So, um, but my grandson, you know, they're 83 years apart to the day. And uh, so he gets her phone and he's trying to swipe it. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to swipe it. And she said, and, and so when I come home off the road, she's like, Erica, Elijah was, he was rubbing on my phone like there was dust on it. <laughs> and I said, oh, he's trying to swipe it. She says, what's he swiping it for? Uh-huh. And, then, and I showed her on my phone and she said, well, what kind of phone does that? So she tried it. She went to Walmart. She didn't like that she had to swipe to unlock it. You know, oh, but he boy. was trying to swipe to see pictures. Uh-huh. And that, that was like, I mean, that you know, these kids, you're right. That that video there, it tells so much truth that mm-hmm. we are leaps and bounds. I mean, even above the 90s. Yeah. Even since the 90s with the, yeah. the, with the brick in a bag. <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah. No phone. Even the even the, the the late nineties and early two thousands paying forty nine cents a minute on a cell phone. You better go find that paper. <laughs> oh, oh, can can you find one now? No. A pay phone? Nope. Can you find an operator? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Can you find an operator? Yeah. You know, God forbid Google. somebody have a a, a touch tone, you know, uh, or a rotary phone. They're uh-huh. out of luck. Well, no. well, the, the operator now is called Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and wait, but the, you know, you remember when? The, and maybe you don't remember this part, but you remember when the operator would actually place the call for you for an additional oh, fee? Absolutely. <laughs> All you do is press your button on the side of your absolutely. phone. Call the Department of Labor. Call uh, uh-huh. Department of Driver Service. <laughs> Which well, one would you like? <laughs> I'm gonna have to interject, guys. I'm, I know you're going back in the day. Next, yeah. next time we'll have something like back in the day when uh, you, you sit there quiet like you don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know nothing. What you saying? I have nothing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yet. yeah. I know you were making part of the time, but you come from Chi Town, so you know. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> but one thing about it, David, we want to thank you so much for coming yeah. on. You know, we're gonna have have you back again, you know, that for tips, um, you know, to help our, our listening people <laughs> or whatever. But um, we're going to have you back, of course, for some more tips. So get ready. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I look forward to it. <laughs> okay, great. And we just want to say this, um, this quote, because we always do a quote at the end. But this is the quote that I want to at least talk to a lot of people that are listening that, are having, you know, depth and, and, and trying to figure out what to do, but worrying is like paying a debt you don't owe. So yes. that's we, what we want to leave with you today is worrying is like paying a debt you don't owe. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So thank All you right. again, David. Um, thank you for having me. Erica. Tell us yes. <laughs> well, okay. Well, hey, uh, folks, if you would like to advertise um, with the CNN podcast, either uh, get a mention on the podcast itself or on our website or both, then please visit our website at thecnnpodcast.com. Um, that also goes for if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, we would love to have you. And uh, like Sheila says, shine the light on your nonprofit and all the good you're doing in the community. Um, we hope this was extremely helpful for somebody. And um, please share it, like it, and subscribe to our podcast. Help us grow to be seen by more people. And fam, until next time, as always, be awesome and be blessed. Mm-hmm.